Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Dean Levy. I'm the Director of Choral Activities at Washington State University and also the Chair for the NAFME Council for Choral Education. As part of our ongoing effort to establish relationships between our council members and their constituents, we've created this series of fireside chats. Today, I'm here with the Western Division representative on the council, Dr. Roger Hale. Dr. Hale serves as the Director of Choral Activities at Dixie State University. He received his BME and MM in Choral Conducting from the University of Utah and a PhD in Choral Music Education from Florida State University. Dr. Hale studied closely with John Cooksey, Andre Thomas, Kevin Fenton, and Clifford Madsen. Frequently serving as a guest conductor clinician, Dr. Hale is the founder and creator of solfasinger.com, a website that helps singers learn solfege. His choral demonstration videos have been viewed more than 2.5 million times, and he has more than 45,000 subscribers all over the world that learn from his videos, and, helps, and it helps thousands of singers each year recognize their potential in choral excellence. He lives in the St. George, Utah area with his wife, KD, and their five children. Well, welcome, Roger. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for doing this, Dean. Absolutely, and thanks, thanks for taking the time. Um, so let's start right off. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what's going on in your world uh, regarding uh, your choirs, uh, the delivery uh, system at your school, what's happening uh, right now? Sure, um, so for anyone that doesn't know where St. George is, it's in the southwest corner of Utah. It is a little bit separated from other metropolitan areas. We're about two, two hours from Las Vegas. Um, but other than that, uh, we're pretty far from anywhere else. It's a beautiful place to live. Lots of uh, tourists come here to see the Red Rock Cliffs and things. But anyway, having said that, it also uh, creates some benefits and some challenges, uh, especially currently in, in our current pandemic situation. Uh, the way that we have been handling our delivery is through face-to-face -face delivery with, uh, and I've been audio recording every one of my rehearsals. If students are unable to attend, they go and listen to that audio recording. And then um, I have a little Google form where they'll submit comments about what they hear and things like that. Um, also, um, you know, as, and not to belabor the pandemic thing, but, um, as numbers are going up, you know, we're having to be more flexible and trying to find different ways to record. And uh, currently in, in our home, we're quarantined. So I'm trying to reach out to uh, my students and try to find engaging ways, just like many of you have done uh, for the entire seven months. So I'm def definitely empathetic to, uh, to the whole spectrum of experiences that people are, are having right now. So uh, you know, just trying to be creative and uh, making sure that each of these students know that I care about them. And uh, that's, it, it's going pretty well so far. Well, good, good. It's, uh, we're trying to be agile and we're trying to pivot <laughs> as much as we can, uh, all for the betterment of our students. So it's, it's great that um, you're able to do that there. Um, so part of the purpose of these videos is to give your region's constituents an opportunity to meet you and learn uh, about some of your experiences. So could you tell us a bit about your background, where you grew up, how you became involved in choir, and basically how did you come to a career in choral music education? Sure. Um, so I, I actually was not in choir in public school. I was in the band. I was just in the band and uh, wouldn't be caught dead singing. <laughs> and here I am. I've had to eat a lot of words. Um, anyway, I uh, I played the trumpet. I just loved that that full body sound that came through a you know band. I was in the marching band at the University of Utah as, as a bachelor degree student. But um, anyway, I I had to take a class on vocal technique that all music ed majors have to take, right? And while I was in there, I had to sing a solo. And I sang this solo for the director of vocal activities who taught the class. And he said, have you ever thought of uh, auditioning for a vocal solo? I go, no, I haven't. Well, I thought, you know, more money, I'll do it. So I auditioned and then the small print said, you need to be a vocal major. I'm like, oh boy. 
Well, uh, coming up to that point, there was writing on the wall. I was starting to have this funny little twitch in my lip when I was playing the trumpet. And when I got, had state, uh, you know, anxiety on stage, it would just shake uncontrollably, like eight on the Richter scale, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, so, but singing, I found out came so naturally and was so rewarding. And um, as you mentioned in my bio, uh, John Cooksey, you know, who's one of the pioneers in the adolescent male voice change, he was the the choir professor at the University of Utah. And I had filled out a little tiny piece of paper in some gen ed class, a uh, little survey said, would you be interested in learning more about the choirs? And I said, well, sure. At that point, you know, in my schooling, I said, wouldn't hurt. Well, he called me personally on the phone one Monday night and said, hey, I, I read this. I think I learned later <laughs> that if there was ever a tenor or a bass, he called them personally <laughs> 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 just so we could have more of them. Right. Sure. <laughs> anyway, I was flattered. I thought, well, man, this professor's reaching out to me. Yeah, I'll give it a try. So I, I showed up the next day and I it was right at the beginning of the semester, like the first two days. And I went in and the experience that I had there, you know, we we sang, uh, I think, I Can Tell the World by Moses Hogan. Um, we sang in Shafa Mirgot, uh by Brahms and it, you know I, w I was good at music I just hadn't experimented with that part except singing a few solos in church and stuff like that but when that full body of choral sound wrapped around me it was something that was different than being on the marching band field with this just loud I mean it was still powerful but this was a different kind of thing for me and I just had goof goosebumps from head to toe I thought, whoa, this is incredible. So both the professors, the band, and the Dr. Cooksey allowed me to do an every other day thing. And that worked only for a semester. I mean, as all of us know, it's really hard to spread your, you know, time like that and be good at both. Well, I decided to jump ship, go into the, into the choir world, and... It's been an incredible ride. I'm very grateful for my band experience. I, when I taught, I taught public school six through 12 band and choir up in Southeast Idaho, little rural uh, town, so beautiful up by a lake called Bear Lake and um, just loved it. But I'm really grateful I had those band years because that helped save me. Uh, you know, I felt very comfortable in the instrumental setting because of my experiences there. And then, of course, my education was in the choir experiences, uh, you know, my later years of education. So anyway, that's that's really why I became a music teacher is John Cooksey's personal phone call and all those incredible experiences. And then later, you know, just uh, briefly, I went back to the U when he he called me on the phone again and he said, hey, I think I'm going to be retiring soon. Do you want to come back and be a, a, the TA, the assistant conductor of the concert choir? And I said, OK, let me think about it. And didn't take us very long. We felt like that was the right path to do. And so I finished my master's degree as he retired from teaching. And then he helped me. Uh, he got his undergrad at Florida State back in 1964, and uh, he called Cliff Madsen on the phone and said, hey, I've got this this uh, student here that would really like to come and study out there. And so um, I, I actually, it's kind of strange, but I got into the assistantship by teaching class guitar. Well, I didn't really take, I didn't really play guitar. So there's the catch. <laughs> anyway, I scrambled to learn guitar. And after that first semester, I got to know Dr. Thomas really well and Kevin Fenton. And I got, you know, started uh, having assistantships with the with the different choirs and just the most marvelous experience I could have down there. Um, then I got my first job at Missouri Western in St. Joseph, Missouri, taught there for five years and was able to come back a little bit closer to my parents and siblings uh, who live in northern Utah uh, and just really glad we 
we're here. Glad we made the move. We just love the area and love my students and uh, the Southwest. Great. You know, it's, um, it's funny. I, well, this is my sixth fireside chat that I've had <laughs> here. And when it comes to how someone came into a career in choral music education or their experiences in choir, not one person waffles. Everybody knows like how it started. Like, oh, I was thinking this and then suddenly this thing happened and bam, I had to, you know, I, it's, yeah. it, it seems like it's a call, you know, and it uh, certainly seemed like that. You got a literal call from John <laughs> Cooksey, you know? Yeah. But uh, well, that's fascinating. Thank you for sharing that with Thank us. Thank you. Um, okay. So you are Western represent or Western division representative on the council. So uh, in short, uh, what do you hope to achieve as, as a representative on the council? You know, I would really like, especially in these times, I would like to be a resource for a really diverse, I mean, think about Las Vegas and think about Southern California. Think about rural Utah. I mean, we have such, I mean, I, I know there are other areas that have that too, but I'm, I'm aware of how many different uh, backgrounds and expertises and the diverse population that we have across this region. It's such a wonderful place to live and be. And I have so many colleagues in these different areas. I want to be a research for multiple areas uh, of questions or, you know, connecting people with other people that, uh, you know, may I may not be the expert, but I may be able to find somebody that is an expert. I, I also serve as the collegiate rep for Utah ACDA. And, you know, I don't, I really want to see a, a, a uniting of the ACDA NAFME concepts because they really, uh, we're really serving the same population. Uh, one thing also that I found, because myself, I taught band and choir, it's interesting through my YouTube videos and, and website how people have reached out to me that are instrumental music educators that have been handed a choir and they are like deer in the headlights. They're like, I don't know what to do. And I've been able to help them. And that's more of a NAFME connection. These people aren't members of ACDA, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of people out there like myself that were teaching something that maybe wasn't in our educational focus, but we can help them. I mean, we all need to be successful. And if this is the choir experience they're going to have, we want these students to have the very best experience they can have with whoever the teacher is standing in front of them. And uh, that's a resource I would like to be, not just for those choral people, but if you're an instrumental guy or girl or anybody out there that wants to reach out I would love to provide you with resources or connect you with somebody that can uh, connect and help you have a, a fantastic experience with your students. Great. Um, well, a little bit later down the road, we'll uh, talk about how people can reach you. And I would ask people um, if you'd like Roger to, uh, um, to help you out in anything, please do contact him. Um, Okay, so there are so many ways in which uh, we as a council can aid the general choral music educator. So what is one thing you feel that we have to address in choral music education today? You know, I think the thing we need to address, and I'm noted, learning this as we all are right now, is things can't always be the way they were. And that's one thing even among my students, you know, some one of the reasons they will come and join the choir at Dixie State is because of an experience they had in the past, right? They want to relive that experience a little bit. And so one thing I would, I really want to address is how can we take, not, not discarding all old ways, because I don't want those ways gone, you know, <laughs> I want to, to be able to do that. But how can we expand our ability and reach as choral educators? And also one thing that we don't do 
very much is we do a really great job of recreating beauty, but we don't do a very good job of choral music educators of creating in the moment beauty. You know, I mean, we do, we take the music, we, we interpret, we do these things, but I think that there are ways that we can help our students feel the, the beauty of actually creating something themselves. And that is so rewarding. You know, those that are arrangers or composers, they feel that all the time. But the majority of students that come into our choirs aren't arrangers and composers. We don't do a whole lot of improvisation. You know, I mean, jazz kind of has the, the monopoly on vocal improvisation. But I think we can do more in our real world and help in our choral world and help these students see what it feels like to experiment and be. And let me just share one little example that, that we just stumbled upon because of the pandemic. Um, I, I had my, my treble chorus who, you know, they just have the most pristine, glorious tone. I, I was talking to them about uh, intonation a little bit. So I just found a sign tone generator on the internet. There's a million of them out there, right? I found the frequency from middle C. I put it on, played it through the, the little rolling audio card I've got where we rehearse. Turned it so the, the volume was comfortable, but present. And then I said, all right, this is do. And, you know, we use the Kerwin hand signs. And I told them, I said, I want you to just, just sing what I show, but I want you to slide up to that pitch or down to that pitch. And with that, that do, with that sign tone, it almost sounded like just a really pure treble tone anyway and it was so exciting to see the 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 excitement in some of these these singers eyes that who aren't music majors right these are people that come from all majors who come and to feel what a perfect fifth feels like in contrast and feel that and how they say whoa i felt that buzz right there behind my ear you know all of a sudden sound waves and acoustics becomes a real thing. It's not just this piece of sheet music that, that um, you know, we're, we're trying to just sing some words. All of a sudden they're realizing that sound and text together are this beautiful marriage of physics, of sound waves that you can literally feel. And the, the power of singing a major seventh and resolving it into that octave or a minor second and resolving it into that that do that unison and feeling everything lock into place is something that I don't think we play around with enough. You know, we just go straight to the music, but that's what our choral music's made of. And those little things of of in the moment experiences with sound, I think is something we can do a little better at. It creates a, a way that musicians can be excited about the medium of sound and then it can branch out to all these other things and that can be done at any single level at any ability it can help people find the ability to match pitch um, and so along with everything we've done that's one thing i've been thinking about a lot because that can be done remotely too there's no there's no metronomic barrier or boundary that we have to follow you don't have to worry about latency, right? You can just go on and, and play with these sounds. And I've done that. I teach aural skills here too. And we've done that as an aural skills class. And at the end, these students have said, you know, that was amazing. It was very needed. It's almost meditative mm -hmm. <laughs> as they, you know, you think of this, this drone and singing in and out of this tone. That's just one experience. But Anyway, I, I think we just need to think out of the box. Let's do something a little bit differently. Let's allow our students to create and not just let us be the ones that create or or recreate. That's great. Yeah, it, it's interesting that uh, during the pandemic here, we are sometimes thrust into innovation. We are just thrust into it that, well, we can't do this. We have to do something else. And um yeah, that's really great. That's great, Roger. Um, let's uh, 
let's keep thinking about the how we can innovate during this time of <laughs> discovery, I guess you could say. Yeah. That's a good optimistic word, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So I have this philosophy that if we truly know somebody, we find out that we all have a lot in common. Um, I have a number of questions for you in a sort of this or that format. As will be made clear in my first question to you, I call these toilet paper questions. So here we go. Toilet paper roll from the top or from the bottom? <laughs> from the top. Uh, coffee or No, tea? I changed my mind from the bottom. Sorry, I know I've already broken the rules. <laughs> but you have to go through that process. Okay, I know TMI, the bottom. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm with you on that. And uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> coffee or tea or perhaps neither? Neither. Okay. Hamburger or taco? Oh, boy. I'd, <laughs> I'd say taco. Okay. Ocean or mountainside? Boy, that's a hard one for me. I love them both. I, I live in the mountains, so I spend more time there. So let's say mountains. Okay. Book or movie? Definitely movie. City or countryside? Probably uh, leaning towards the countryside. <laughs> the runaway aspect of me is is uh, connected with right now. Right? Sure. <laughs> the retreat. Um, toaster eggs. You know, I make my own bread every week, so toast, definitely. There you go. Uh, dog or cat? You know, I... I'm going to have to break the mold here. We have a rabbit that lives in our living room. Really? Yes. What's your rabbit's name? <laughs> Leo the Lop. He has lop ears. And uh, <laughs> we usually start my remote aural skills class with me grabbing the rabbit and bringing him up to the webcam. And everyone types, that was therapeutic. Thank you. And I put the <laughs> rabbit back down. It's right. <laughs> it's like you begin a routine. Like they can't go on without seeing Leo the Lop. <laughs> That's like. right. <laughs> okay um well we're running out of time here roger but is there anything else you'd like uh to say to your constituents here before we go you know be positive this really is going to make us better in the future no matter what it is it could be a pandemic now and something later in three years right but uh let's work together let's be a team please reach out let's not let our our differences divide us but let's let our our common love of sound right of what happens when we feel that sound wash over our bodies let's let that be our uniting factor and what it can do to bring us together please reach out to me um r hale at dixie.edu you can uh, Google and find me in any way and reach out. I would love to assist in any way I can. Uh, those of you out there, instrumentalists or vocalists uh, that need any assistance I can provide. Great. And that was going to be my next question. And uh, what we'll do is on the comments of this video, we'll put both your website, soulfussinger.com, as well as your email address down there. Um, so, um, Roger, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we really appreciate it today. Um, I would encourage your constituents in the Western Division to reach out to you. So for those of you watching, thank you for your time and please reach out to the NAFME Council for Choral Music Education if there's anything we can do to assist you. Have a wonderful day.